to have a double barrel dosage of Kennedys. I'm used to having the pleasure of introducing one or the other. Dang if I can keep them straight. Now I have the pleasure of being very clear to say in recent years of saying, ah, beard and no beard. And I can kind of keep things straight that way. We'll begin with James Ron Kennedy, a founding member of the League of the South, a life member of both the National and the Louisiana Sons of Confederate Veterans. Mr. Kennedy lives in Mandeville, Louisiana with his wife and two sons. He received a master's in health administration from Tulane University in New Orleans, as well as his bachelor's from Northeast Louisiana University. But more importantly is the Kennedy's involvement in all aspects of Southern heritage. Many of us recall a certain book that we encountered a long time ago before there was a leak. The South was right, now sold well over 125,000 copies, readily available even bookstores outside the South. Ron, his twin brother Johnny, have the authors of numerous pro-Southern books, stayed in print. You know, truth is error's best antagonist. I can't phrase it any better way. The talk today is entitled Local Self-Government Facilitating the Creation of Moral Communities. Please join me in a warm, rousing League of the South welcome for Ron Kennedy. All right, thank you very much, and uh, this is, there, hopefully that's going to be all right for you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to try to make this short and sweet and try to get to the point in a hurry. But first of all, let me say thank you again, graciously thank you for your support in the past, for the fact that that book, uh, The South Was Right, Donald and I wrote that back when we were two country boys from Mississippi just moved down to Louisiana and we didn't have enough sense to know that we couldn't write a book. <laughs> and so we did it. Uh, one of the most interesting things, when I showed the manuscript to several of the SCB members, they t warned me not to publish that. The federal government will put you in jail. <laughs> And my retort was, I hope it's enough danger to them that they'll want to put me in jail. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, you, if it weren't for you, your inspiration, your, your kindness, uh, the book would not have been the success that it has been. Uh, and we do appreciate it. Donald and I both will appreciate very much your support. And I hope you realize that Donald and I have real jobs. We don't make a living selling books. Uh, and uh, I've had doctors, I, I'm, I'm a risk management manager for a uh, insurance company. We insure physicians for medical malpractice. A uh, 20 year career, soon to go into semi-retirement. Thank you, Lord. But uh, I don't know how I'm gonna live on uh, you know, less money, but it's gonna happen. But nonetheless, uh, a lot of times I've, I've talked to doctors when they find out that, oh, you sold 100,000 books at $20 each, and you can just see, oh, how much money you made. Folks, if you're going to make a living selling books, you better sell a million copies because you ain't going to get any money. Otherwise, you can just forget about it. But we wrote those books for you. We wrote it for the people of the South. And uh, it's been very successful. Now, one thing I want to tell you quickly is that, uh, you know, I'm from Louisiana. Born and raised in Mississippi, though, so this is not a South Louisiana accent. Y'all know that. Y'all shouldn't have any trouble uh, understanding me because uh, this Mississippi accent just gets thicker the longer I stay in Alabama. But, uh, and I love it, too, you know. If I stay down among the, the Cajuns too long, I, I lose this Mississippi, so I had to go up and visit my cousins, you know. It don't take about 15, 20 minutes, and, you know, I'm drawing out just like the rest of you. That's no problem. But I, I do love Louisiana. I really, Don and I were laughing. Uh, we lived in Louisiana longer than we lived in Mississippi. Uh, uh, even though uh, we still own some land in Mississippi that was in our family from the original uh, Choctaw Session, number two. So that's how long it's been in the family. Uh, Don and I have walked around in the 
plowed fields and picked up arrowheads any number of times. And, and it's a real uh, connection to the soil uh, that, that only Southerners can truly appreciate. And you know, even when we are raised on asphalt now, we still have that connection to the soil. It means so much. Uh, you know, it's the only thing that endures uh, in, in the world that, that we can live in now. But being a Louisiana guy, I did pick up some real good information in my life in Louisiana. And I, I, I've got to tell you this. Y'all all know the story about uh, the Irishman that said that the bagpipes was a joke. The Irish pay, played on the Scots, but the Scots never caught on. Yeah, y'all heard that? Huh? Well, I, I've got to warn you. Now, don't, please don't be offended by this. And I don't mean to come to, into your home and, 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 and criticize. I'm, not, I'm trying to save you embarrassment, okay? I don't want my Alabamians to get embarrassed. But Folgers and Maxwell House are playing a joke on y'all. Okay? That's not coffee. <laughs> They are playing a joke on you and they're laughing at you, okay? So please, you know, if you have to go on the internet, you just go in and you Google, uh, you know, we, want, we like French market chicory, okay? French market chicory, it comes in a little tin can too and it's real nice, so when it's empty you can put kale sh shell casings in it, you can put shotgun shells in it, you can put, uh, you know, buttons off of dead Yankee frock coats in it. <laughs> with those tin cans, they are, never throw a tin can away because you can use, especially in the hard times coming. So you want, but, and now if you can't tolerate the, uh, the, the chicory, which, you know, I can understand your sensitivity, you see, community dark roads, okay? And listen, one other little quick note. There's no plague going on in the bean fields down in South and Central America. There's plenty, gracious plenty supply of coffee. So don't be afraid when you make the coffee to scoop up heavy and do, you know, just, you know, you don't, if you, if you can see through the coffee, it's not coffee. Just because it's hot and hot, it ain't coffee, okay? Okay, that, that's all. Just, just, you know, I learned this. Now, I, I was, I was plagued by the same problem growing up in Mississippi. Okay, but I learned my better, so I just want to let y'all know that. And that's because I love you, okay? <laughs> All right, so much for the foolishness. Uh, I really do like strong coffee. I, don't, uh, I think that I did learn that in Louisiana. Let's talk serious a minute. We live today in one of the most degraded moral conditions that God's people, I believe, have lived in since biblical days. Our society. The morals of our society is established by Hollywood. Right. So therefore, we are, you know, I, I, some of you who are linguistic uh, experts, you can tell I'm fighting. Are we an, an, an immoral society or an amoral society? You know, I think an immoral society is better than an amoral society because immoral implies that at least you had the benefit of knowledge and you rejected or floated away from knowledge, which helps you to be able to reclaim or redeem yourself through the grace of God. Amoral, you just, you're lost. You don't even have a compass, a moral compass. But our society has come to the point where there's things that are said in our living rooms through the television that if it had been said in my mother's and father's day, I would probably would not be here today, or at least I'd be wearing false teeth, okay? <laughs> now, my daddy was a Baptist deacon, God-fearing man, wonderful person, never heard a, a profanity out of him in his life, except one time, any of you LSU, uh, any of you uh, people here from Mississippi, well, you want, wouldn't appreciate this. So one time when LSU stole the ball game from Ole Miss, I did hear, hear my dad say, damn. <laughs> but other than that, that's the only time. So, but he believed in a biblical worldview. He believed in the Bible. And my mother believed in the Bible. If you'll, 
Who uh, bought the last copy of Nullifying Tyranny? I, I asked somebody, to, can, can I have a bar? I need to read something out of it. I sold my last copy. And I said, I, I'm going to get you involved and bring it up. I'm going to need it just a minute. And I will get it back to you. Thank you, Josh. In the introduction, uh, or to the dedication, I, I, Don and I dedicated this book, uh, Nullifying Tyranny, Creating Moral Communities in an Immoral Society, to our mother and father. And I, our mother and father is probably no different than your mother and father. Uh, growing up in the deep south, the conservative south, the God-fearing south, a wonderful place to raise your children until the federal government decides to start messing things up once again. So, we are in a condition now that we need to reestablish a moral society. Well, how do we reestablish a moral society? It is absolutely imperative to understand you can't have a moral society without moral people. You can't have it. It's impossible. Now, the old school Southern conservatives, I'm talking about back from Patrick Henry, the founding fathers, Jefferson, John C. Calhoun, Jefferson Davis, from that old school of Southern conservatives, they realized from the get-go that man is a fallen creature in need of redemption. They understood that moral redemption comes from God. Not government, but from God. They understood that sinful man needs an intercessor to plead his case before a holy God. But not just any intercessor. You know, as good a, 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 an advocate, uh, an attorney as Mr. Paroka is, I don't want him pleading my case before the Lord. And that's not, no, there's no, nothing against you as an attorney. I'm sure you would do a better job than anyone else on earth. But the problem is to stand before God and plead a case, you have to be holy because the holy God will not commune with a sin or sin, a sinful person. We need a perfect intercessor to, to be our advocate. And we've got one. Thank you, Lord. We have one. Now that's the, the part of sinful man needing an intercessor to stand between him and the Holy God is a very important point because theologically, of course, it's important. But it's also important politically because we'll see that it plays a role in the thinking of Southern political philosophy. Now our founding fathers understood the fallen nature of man. They understood it when they crafted the Constitution. James Madison noted that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Amen. Hey, no problem. Thomas Jefferson noted the danger posed by men governing their fellows when he questioned, have we found angels in the form of men to govern us? No, no, this is a to govern your fellows is a dangerous situation. Thomas Jefferson even went to the point of saying that the president, he was president at the time, the president, Congress, the governors would become wolves if the people do not keep their guard up, if they do not guard jealously their reserved rights. Very important. Former Vice President and Senator John C. Calhoun explained that all governments were a danger to individual liberty because men were by nature, by nature, more concerned about those things that affect them personally than those things that affect society at large. Or to paraphrase that, Ron would say, Men left to their own devices tend to be uh, toward tend more toward selfish motive than an altruistic motive. That's just the way we are. That's the fallen nature of man. Some men are better, some are not. Some are, are, are Stalins and others are Gandhis. But none are perfect. And none can be trusted with the absolute power and authority over their fellows. Now, understanding the inherent dangers of government is so very important. Government as an agent of, of oppression is not new. That's something that 
we must, it's not new to us today. Now, we realize it today better than ever. And you know, we do need to be thankful of that. There are more people aware of the danger of government today than ever. I just hope we haven't reached the tipping point where there's more people enjoying the benefits of exploiting the rest of the productive element so that they're going to totally dominate us. But this is not new. This didn't happen with Barack Obama. It didn't happen with FDR. Guess what? It didn't even happen with Abraham Lincoln. It happened, but it, didn't, it wasn't original with them. The, the exploitation of government against men is as old as civilization itself. And had I had this copy, I would have had this already open. Excuse me, let me look it up right quick. And see, if you had your copy, you could be following along with me. And, uh, I'm sorry you don't. And I'm all sold out. And, uh, Well, it's in here. I was reading it just a minute ago. Do what? What did you say? Aha, now I find it. I, the problem is I can't see as well as I used to. This is the next time we print a book, I'll just do a large print edition. All right. Now, what was I saying? It's not new. It's not different. It's, it's not original with the Democrats. It's not original with the Republicans. It's not original with the Federalists. It's not original with the Yankees. It's not original with Abraham Lincoln. Go back, go back, go back, go back. No, even the Lord God Almighty recognized the inherent danger of a centralized government and told His people and warned His people, you don't want a centralized government you want to keep local control. You want government to be close at hand. You don't want to be far away in some large centralized authority. Now, a lot of people don't believe that, but I know you do. You don't need this, but uh, I'm going to read it anyway. This is taken uh, from uh, 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 18. Uh, this, is not, this is not Holy Writ, but it's quoting Holy Writ, and it's good old, uh, you know... Uh, 1611 King Jimmy, so uh, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, somebody might have to uh, explain that to a, a Mark Tom, who, uh, but King James, 1611 Bible, Protestants. You know. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we borrowed it from, from your people and it translated it, so yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I like to get Mark. I don't know what you're doing up here in Protestant Alabama. You belong in, in New Orleans and Louisiana with the oh, rest of us. But are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. This is this is what was said. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people who asked of him a king. All oh, the people, we want a king. We want a king. And he said, "This will be the manner of the king who shall reign over you." King Barak, oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> he will take your sons and send them to Iraq and appoint them for himself as his charioteers uh, to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself captains over thousands, captains over fifties, and will set them to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and to be cooks and to be bakers. He will take your fields and your water rights and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your seed, of your vineyards, and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your choice young women, choice young men, your asses, and put them to his word. He will take the tenth of your sheep, and he shall be, and, and ye, ye shall be his servants. 
And ye shall cry out in that day because of King Obama and of whom ye shall have chosen. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. At that time, Israel was ruled by judges. Judges who was drawn from the tribes. The tribes, a kinship group. A kinship group, a nation. Nation meaning a kinship group of people who shared common culture, common heritage, common language. Kith and kin. The old Scotch-Irish term, kith and kin. Even if you're not my blood relative, we're kith together in, in a same community, in the same culture. We believe in the same values. We support the same ideas. We're kith and kin. This is, and we're ruled by a judge. Close to home, someone we all know. We can trust. And if we can't trust them, we can get rid of them real easy. Get another judge. But the people say, and this is the saddest, I think this is such a sad thing. The people say, nay, we shall have a king. And they got a king. Yes, so even the Lord God in the Old Testament thousands of years ago, saw the danger of large centralized government. Our ancestors, Josh, don't let me forget about this. I'll take it back and sell it again. <laughs> now the colonists, uh, when they, uh, they saw this same sequence of events that uh, explained in, in, uh, in 1 Samuel, they saw it in King George. They saw the danger of a centralized government and, and the centralized authority of the parliament and the oppressive manner in which they were treating the colonists. They saw this danger and they were determined to remove themselves from the tyranny of an absolute monarch and they were determined that their, and that their descendants would not suffer a similar fate. So they established sovereignty in America. No longer did the sovereign, the king, belong in England. No, sovereignty was in America. But where in America? And we're speaking of political sovereignty, not divine sovereignty. But where in America? Well, it's obvious. The, the British colonies in America seceded from the British Empire. They did so as individual sovereign states. Virginia seceded in May, long, a month before the, uh, the Declaration of Independence was signed, July the 4th. Uh, when the British government was forced to recognize the United States via the, article, uh, via the Treaty of Paris, they recognized each state by name, each sovereign state by name, leagued together as the United States in order to uh, mutually gain their separate independence. These sovereign states then formed the first government of the United States under the Articles of Confederation. And I believe it's Article 2 states specifically that, that they retain their freedom, independence, and what? Sovereignty. Each independent, used to be colony, now a state. You know, a lot of people get confused when we look at national, we say, well, the states of the world. Well, because nation and state is used, they're, they're interchangeable in that sense. The colonists use the term states and nation interchangeably. That each, each of the colonies, the 13 independent sovereign colonies, were the nation unto themselves. Lead together for mutual defense. So in 1787, when the new constitution was offered, it was offered to those states that were willing to secede from the Articles of Confederation and join in with the Constitution. It took nine states to ratify it, but the ratification was only, it only compelled those who so ratified, those who stayed out, and North Carolina and, and uh, then Rhode Island stayed out for well over a year because they just didn't trust this new big government. So, uh, in the United States, as originally established, sovereignty resided with we the people within our respective state. We the people make up the sovereign community. 
a term uh, used muchly by uh, John C. Calhoun. But the sovereign community within our respective state and the government of our state is the corporate representative of we the people of that state. Now notice, the we, call, we say state sovereignty, but the state's not sovereign per se. It only represents the sovereign will of the sovereign community. It's the corporate representative of we the people. We the people at the local level control our government in the original establishment of American liberty. We the people rule by, via a limited government and the government obey our will. This is primarily... What is our, the, the will of we the people? What, what, what do we mainly want from the federal government? Leave us alone, to be left alone. What did Jefferson Davis say in his first inaugural address? All we ask is to be left alone. The meddling Yankee can't leave anything alone. Absolutely not. Especially when his commercial interest is at stake. <laughs> so, interposition is a theory advanced by Southern conservatives early on. Now, again, think of this interposition. And it came from their theological perspective. Sinful man was in trouble, a wrathful God. He needed an intercessor to interpose between our just desserts. <laughs> And, a, a, and God, and a holy God, the Lord Jesus, provided that intercessor, that interposed His blood between us and a fiery hell. What a wonderful thought. And then, look at for the federal government versus the we the people. So, in the original setting, we the people of the sovereign state of Alabama. Let's see, I'm peeking on it. What about Georgia? Uh, we got anybody from uh, South Carolina here? All right, good. We the people of fine, fine state of South Carolina. Uh, my people came from South Carolina. Uh, but we the people of the a sovereign state of Georgia, the, the federal government decides it's going to take away our water rights. Hey, you can't do that, federal government. We, the sovereign state of Georgia, will interpose between an aggressive and oppressive federal government to defend our citizens. Because as a citizen, even if you're well armed, you're not armed as much as the federal government after, uh, oh, uh, I can remember a long time ago, or oh, uh, any of y'all remember Judge, uh, Judge Perez uh, and, and Governor Jimmy Davis in, in Louisiana. Governor per, uh, Judge Perez who wanted to fight the federal government. And, and, and Governor Jimmy Davis called and said, Judge, we can't do that. They got the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> well, today in South Carolina, they got the bomb. I don't care how well armed you are. So as an individual citizen, you have, it's that old thing, you can't fight City Hall, well you sure as heck can't fight the federal government as an individual citizen. But it's the responsibility of the sovereign state to interpose between you and an aggressive federal government. And, and it's been done so many times. You all have heard this. Uh, I'll make it quick. You've heard this before. Interposition in play. The first time it was used was uh, in about uh, 1792, as I recall, about five years after the Constitution was ratified. Now, when the Constitution was being debated, the anti-federalists, who were right, argued against it. Patrick Henry and, and just a whole number of, of as a matter of fact, the majority of, this, of the uh, legislatures of each state was opposed to the Constitution at first. The writing of the Federalist, sort of dissu the Federalist Papers dissuaded some. They felt like it was a compromise. One of the promises made by the Federalists, the High Federalists at Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, and I believe it was in uh, Federalist number 45, is footnoted thoroughly in the Kennedy books. I don't remember which one. You'll have to buy all up and read them. <laughs> I don't remember which one, but anyway, but I believe it's Federalist 45. Hamilton promised the states because the anti-Federalists were saying, no, no, this Supreme Court that you're setting up 
This federal judiciary is dangerous to the sovereignty of the states. It's threatening the states. Why? Well, We'll have, we'll have the states pulled before the Supreme Court and, and, and brought to judgment before the federal courts. And Hamilton sort of laughed it off. All oh, you anti-federalists, y'all are just extremists. You know, y'all y'all must be members of the League of the South or something. <laughs> well, what's the matter with you? You know that a sovereign, as in a king or a sovereign, cannot be called before a, 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 the, the court. The sovereign is superior to the court. The sovereign cannot be called before the court. You anti-federalists are crazy. Y'all go ahead and vote, vote for it. It's, it's all, it'll be all right. Just trust me. <laughs> Hamilton is a liar. Or was a liar. Absolute liar. Thomas Jefferson said, Alexander Hamilton is a monarchist and a monarchist bottomed on corruption. Thomas Jefferson saw what Hamilton was. Hamilton wanted this massive, big government so he could control the commerce and get him and his friends very wealthy. And he did. He did. Well, five years after that Federalist paper, guess what? The state of Georgia, and I believe it was the Olmstead case, was called before the federal court to defend itself. Man, the legislature. Where are our Georgians? Where's our Georgians? They got some folks in Georgia. God, all right, great. You've all heard this story. I'm sure all of you've heard this story. But, but the legislature of Georgia was outraged. I cannot believe they're trying to call the sovereign state of Georgia before a federal supreme court to answer to the federal court. That is absurd. <coughs> and just to make sure it doesn't happen, let's pass a, a resolution that if any federal agent comes into the state of Georgia and tries to enforce this document, he shall be seized, taken straight away to the gallows, and hung by the neck of your head without him a fair of hardship. Somebody needs to send that to uh, Justice Roberts. <laughs> That was in the days of wooden ships and iron men. We don't need wooden ships anymore, but God sent us some more iron men. Do you know? yeah. Okay, that, that got everybody upset, so they rushed out. Well, we made a simple mistake, so let's pass the 11th Amendment to prevent that from happening. And it was a futile effort to try to control the federal government because we all know that the federal supremacists are going to find a way around the Constitution. You know, what was it that Patrick Henry was concerned about when he was fighting against the adoption of the Constitution? It wasn't, he wasn't fighting against the verbiage of the Constitution. He looked and said, look, I don't have a problem with the Constitution. Well, you know, the, the, the words of the contract of the Constitution sounds just fine. That's not where I have the problem with. I have a problem with the people you're trying to lead us with up north. Here, here. I don't trust those people. Whoo! That was prophecy. That was prophecy. All right, so... Passed the 11th Amendment, and then came in 1798 the, the famous uh, Virginia and Kentucky Resolves. Here we had the federal president, the federal Congress, and the federal Supreme Court. That's just rain, folks. I don't know. I live in Louisiana. What's the deal? I mean, it hasn't rained in, in what, 12 hours since I've been here. That's just rain. I feel a little. <laughs> Three and a half inches at my house yesterday. I mean, you know, we've just been... So, we had all three, you know, we, we love to talk in, in school, government schools, about the division of powers, how the federal government is split up in division of, in order to, to, to control power, you know, the executive, Congress, and, and the, uh, the judiciary. <coughs> Here we have an example for the federal uh, president, the federal Congress passes a law, the federal executive enforces, and the Supreme Court actually puts people in jail for speaking ill against President Adams. A plain violation of 
the words and the spirit of the freedom of, of, of speech in, in the very first amendment. Didn't make any difference. Now, there's an old English common law dictum, and Michael, you might, Mr. Baruka, you might know this. I, I don't, I, I've seen it a long time. I've quoted it so many times. It's a right absent a remedy is a nullity. I heard that before, Michael? Yeah. A right absent a remedy is a nullity. I can say that I have a right to peaceful enjoyment of my property. When my neighbor sets up wolf or boom boxes and at 3 o'clock in the morning is playing and is, is driving me crazy, I have a right to the peaceful enjoyment of my property. So I pick up the telephone and I call the high sheriff. And the high sheriff tells me, well, that's nothing I can do about it, Ron. Just go back to sleep. Well, do I have a right to peaceful enjoyment? You know, the, the theory of my right is still there, but the practicality is not there because there's no way to enforce that right. Here we have a violation of the First Amendment. I mean, we're talking about ten years after the, well, I think it was about seven years after the passage of the Constitution. A plain and absolutely total violation. Freedom of, of speech and freedom of press. And yet, Congress, the President, and the Supreme Court all are co-conspirators. Where's our right? Who is the policeman to protect our right, to enforce our right? Well, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison knew who it was. That's when they passed the uh, resolves of, of 98. And in those resolves, they said, the state of Virginia, God bless her, the state of Kentucky, God bless her. We nullify this whole thing because we have a right to judge for ourselves if a law is pursuant to the Constitution and we have the right to use any means necessary yeah. to protect our people yeah. from an oppressive federal government. So we all have seen in a position used in the political world. But what happened? What happened? What would happen if, say, the state of Arizona was being flooded by armed and unarmed invasion across the international border and it was causing chaos and crime and the, and the, and, and the state of uh, that the, the state of Arizona decided they wanted to enforce laws that were not being enforced. A right without a remedy is a nullity. Arizona has no rights unless granted by the supreme federal government. What a change. What an absolute change. The truth of the matter is Arizona doesn't have borders anymore. Arizona has no borders. The borders belong to the supreme federal government and the supreme federal government will decide whether or not it wants to enforce or, or its, its laws regarding uh, illegals. So, what's happened? Well, it all started with Hamilton, well, I won't say, but um, Hamilton was a major start. Uh, implied powers is, is what he used in order to establish the first bank of the United States, a great way to get money from the common people <coughs> and, and use the taxing power of the federal government to pay off debts in case the big bankers on Wall Street, back then, even then, Wall Street, by the way, Hamilton's office was on Wall Street. I don't know if any of that. I found that rather interesting. The more things change. Uh, but nonetheless, implied powers. That's the beginning of the living Constitution. John Marshall, the uh, second uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, came up with a really good idea for the expansion of federalism. It's called judicial review. By that we shall say that only the Supreme Court can decide whether or not a law is constitutional or not. My, 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 isn't that a great feat? So all of a sudden, now stop and think about it. Stop and think about it. The, the uh, Constitution was created by sovereign states. The sovereign states are the principle. The Constitution is in effect a compact or a treaty between the sovereign states by which they created 
an agent, the federal government, to do certain things, certain specific things. Very limited, very specific. Now, if you have a contract, and we all get together and we say, we're going to create this corporation, and we're going to appoint this guy over here as our agent. And that agent's going to have certain powers and authority per the, the, the contract. Oh, thank you, sir. After I've been talking about it, I'm not sure I should drink it, but uh, if I drop over, no good deed goes on. It's the assumption of risk, doctor, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So, we have this contract. We've got an agent. Our agent is supposed to do certain specific things. And all of a sudden, the agent is exceeding his authority. And we say, whoa, agent, you don't have the contract. doesn't say you can do that. You're taking stuff that belongs to us and using it for your own good or giving it to your friends. Uh, agent, you can't do that. And the agent looks at you and says, well, wait a minute. Let me see that contract. Oh, yeah, I think it says I do have it. Now, go away. What kind of contract is that? That's not a contract. That's a waiver of civil liberties. And that in itself is against sound public policy, isn't it? You can't waive your right to be a human being, to be treated equally, to be treated. You can't waive that even. <coughs> so our agent has exceeded his authority. Who has the right to decide whether or not he's exceeded? Not the agent, the federal government, but we the people, as represented by our corporate representative, the sovereign state. Well, that's the way it should be, but that's not the way it is. Now, it's very interesting. I, I found this very interesting. I get into argument with uh, attorneys a lot. I do like to argue with attorneys uh, because it's surprising a little con law. They, they slept through con law. Don't no, that, Michael? It, you didn't, Michael. I know you didn't, but, but a lot of them. You know, it, it, there's more important things in law school than con law because most of us not going to go to the Supreme Court. And, you know, not at all. <coughs> so they said, well, wait, Ron, the federal government, of course it has the right to decide. Don't you realize there's a supremacy clause? So, well, of course there's a supremacy clause. As a matter of fact, John C. Calhoun said that's the most important clause in the Constitution in support of state sovereignty, states' rights, and the right of interposition. Well, what do you mean? It says all laws of past are, are, are the supreme law of the land. It's the supreme law of the land. And they repeat it again, get a little shrill. It's the supreme law of the land. Yeah. I'm going, well, take it down a couple of octaves. You've got to back up a little bit. What does the what does the supremacy clause says? All laws passed pursuant to this constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. The activating force of that clause, the clause, the part that gives that clause power, is not su supreme law of the land. That's the result of a law being passed pursuant to the constitution. Well, if it's not pursuant to the Constitution, it's null and void. I don't care how many times the Rock Obama signs it. It ain't. I don't care what Justice Roberts says. It ain't because it's unconstitutional. It's not. It's not the law. Then who judges? Does the Supreme Court judge? Well, certainly the Supreme Court can judge, and its judgment would be persuasive. What's the opposite of persuasive? Mandatory. It's not mandatory. It's merely persuasive. In most cases, it'll stand. But if there's a question of the reserve rights, of oppression of the, we the people, then the state reserves the final authority. The sovereign state, we the people, not nine unelected judges or, as they like to say, Judge Roberts and the girls. <laughs> Daniel Webster and the radical abolitionists came along with an idea called higher law. Higher law. There's something higher than the Constitution. You know, uh, the, the, the psychology of the whole international Western world was going through a great change in its contemplation about slavery, human slavery. You know, up until that time, it was, you know, it was, it was a 
It was a given. I mean, it wasn't a question. It was a given. And now there was a great change there. <coughs> well, the Constitution plainly allowed for it. But, in order to get around the language of the contract, they said, well, there's something higher than the Constitution. Let me tell you something. Once you get outside those abstract, absolute values within the Constitution and start looking for nebulous higher law, you know, we're going to be asking Buddha and, and Confucius and, and, you know, some body sitting around contemplating their navel of what's the higher law that we need. No. No. The Constitution is very, very plain. Even an old boy from Mississippi can understand it. So I know y'all can. So, obviously, the Constitution, the law that we had, the, the society that was built by that Constitution is no longer effective. It's been destroyed. The question is, how do we reclaim liberty? How do we reclaim that right? And there is where the fun begins. Because, folks, we're at a point in time when we may be able to reclaim our liberty. Now, the New Englanders don't want their liberty. Or their liberty is different than ours. Their definition, that's their business. Right. If the folks in Washington and Oregon, if, <coughs> if their definition, that's their business. But we have a chance. And it's very, very great that this is the time. You know, we've had a century of conservative failure. This past century was a century of conservative failure, starting around the Progressive Era, uh, 1913, with the uh, Federal Reserve Act, uh, you know, with all the progressive stuff. Just one failure after another, one retreat after another. But now we have a chance to change that. But look, we can't change it by doing the same things we've always done. Yes. Absolutely not. <coughs> Think about this. We keep doing conservative, not us now. Uh, you all not include, but conservatives, those, those people who love the, the flag, love the United States, and I'm not mocking them. They, they, they've been the, the, they're the results of government education. I mean, God love them. You, you know, they're in trouble. We need to help them. That's our job. We need to help them. <coughs> but these people keep saying, and I hear it every time I go to a tea party meeting, I hear this. Oh boy. Oh boy. We're going to elect some good conservatives now and everything's going to be hunky-dory. <laughs> Where have you been for the last 100 years even? I mean, take a look and see. You can't keep doing the same thing. You'll get the same results. Something's going on here. We're not winning. We're losing every year. It's less liberty. You're excited. I remember when... I believe I got some there, but I may need that too. Thank you. You didn't put any bourbon in it, did you? I can really get excited with a little bourbon. Oh. We keep doing the same thing. I heard this one time. This lady tell me about the trouble she was having with her son. He was, you know, about nine years old, eight, nine years old. She kept noticing that, that any of you moms here got sons? They probably got grown now. Okay. And well, you might, you will understand this. She got to looking at her laundry and said, there's no underwear for him. I'm not keeping, I'm not washing any underwear from that boy. What's going on? You know? So she, you know, she found a little discussion. She said, Dad, up to check, check it out. I said, you go out and see what's going on with him. Look in his drawer and see if he's got clean underwear. He went up and opened it. Oh, nice folded out. Mom done a great job. A lot of clean underwear in there. And he looked over his son and said, Son, are, are you, have you been changing your underwear? Oh yeah, Dad, every, every, every morning I change my underwear. Well, where do you get the underwear? He said, out of that hamper right over there. <laughs> out of that hamper? Yeah. Well, son, when you take your dirty underwear off, well, what do you do with it? I throw it in that hamper right there. <laughs> We've been doing the same thing. <laughs> we had 
The dirty underwear of Bill Clinton, we took him off and put on the dirty underwear of George Bush. We took that dirty underwear off and put on the dirty underwear of Barack Obama. And now we are really excited because we go put on the dirty underwear called Mitt Romney. Oh, time is good. Time is good. Yes. Let me tell you something. The, the government establishment, the status quo, this, the ruling elite, they want this. This is the way they keep power. They can keep the power regardless of who is in office in Washington, D.C. Because it's going to be a party guy. It's going to be one of the ruling elite. They are not going to do anything that will trouble their estate that they have established. They make great profit off of exploiting you and me. And let me tell you something. As bad as it is for you and me, the way they are exploiting the African-American community is a sin against God. And the poor people don't even know it, don't understand it. So, what do we do? Well, let me tell you, we're not going to win this battle by trying to elect a, a good guy in Washington, D.C. or even electing a good conservative <coughs> to send to the Senate or the House. <coughs> Those are good... You know, I, I certainly don't want to elect a bad one, but, but look, there's other things that we need to be doing locally in order to turn this thing around, and we can. What we need is not another tactical victory. We need a strategic victory. You know, at, at, at Manassas, Manassas first, good old Beauregard, General Beauregard and the Southerners and, and all, they did a great job. They whooped the Yankees bad. Some people call it Yankee Run. You know, it was a great, exciting time. And Southerners celebrated that victory. But let me ask you something. From a historical perspective, what good did it do? A tactical victory won't help us at all. As a matter of fact, when you have limited resources like the South do, like we do now, tactical victories merely bleed you dry. There was an old Confederate veteran once, and he was asked, sort of being chastised by some younger kids, and he was real old, and he said, he said, hey, I thought y'all were going to win that war. How come you didn't win that war? Why'd you let the Yankees whoop you? He said, the Yankees didn't whoop us. We just wore ourselves out of killing Yankees. You know, that is really sad, but it's true. Tactical victories won't get the job done. We need a strategic victory. We don't need a, a Manassas victory. We need a Yorktown victory. Okay? A strategic victory. A victory that will fundamentally change the way government is done in this country. That's what we're looking for. So how do we do it? How do we get there? Well, let me finish up. I don't know what time was I supposed to be finished? <coughs> All right. I was a little late getting started, so I'm going to take somebody else. You can take it off of Donald's time. Oh. <laughs> Let me tell you, in, in uh, Reclaiming Liberty, and we sold all of them out, and uh, I, I really hope that some of you will buy it because I can tell by the sales it's not doing that well, but Reclaiming Liberty has been out for, for several years. But that is... The story in, which, or in the book in which I describe the type of society we're going to have as Southerners after we became after we become free. So we talk about a lot of things, you know, the, the fiat money, education, health. There's a lot of things in there. <coughs> but uh, I hope you get that. But in that book, I set up this fictitious state called Oklahoma. Now, Oklahoma is a interesting state that does a lot of things because a lot of people say well you can't do that because if you do that the states would do thus and such you know and it'd be horrible and there'd be no way we can control these states and i show through the use of this fictitious state how no you don't have to use bloody bayonets in a limited republic in order to have people that agree with the, the constitution so let me give you a fictitious state of Oklahoma. Got a fellow by the name of Johnny Rev. And Johnny Rev is just tired 
of what's going on. He's tired of, of Justice uh, Roberts. He's tired of Barack Obama. He's tired of the National Republicans. He is just fed up to here. It's time to do something. Now, Johnny Reb realizes he don't have enough money to run for president. He even if he did because all the news media, even Fox News, which so people, many people love, <coughs> even Fox News would be against him. How is he going to change this government? How is he going to get his people in the South to agree with him and be willing to stand the line and fight? How is he going to do this? He said, well, this is what I'm going to do. In the state of Oklahoma, I'm going to run for lieutenant governor. Now, Oklahoma is one of those states where the lieutenant governor doesn't have a lot to do. You know, some states, the lieutenant governor's position is pretty important. You know, you vote in the House or the Senate, and <coughs> very important. <coughs> in Oklahoma, this is the job of the lieutenant governor. It's very similar to the lieutenant governor in, in uh, Louisiana. Once a morning, when you wake up, you go over the telephone, you call Governor Jindal's wife. Hey, Miss Pushtah Jindal, is, uh, did the governor wake up this morning? Yeah, he woke up. Okay, thank you. Call me if, he, if anything happens to him. Bye. That's it. He's done his duty. Now, he's going to spend the rest of the day doing political things, trying to get money raised and helping people, doing favors to build a coalition because his job or his desire <coughs> in Oklahoma, as in Louisiana, is to go on to higher office and finally end up in the uh, with the learned elite in Washington, D.C. and become part of the status quo and enjoy all the, the perks, the privileges uh, that, that they have there in Washington, D.C. for successful politicians. Well, Johnny Reb says, look, i got a better idea, folks. We're going to get together. We're going to get a couple thousand people that, that believe like we do, and we're going to raise enough money, probably $100,000, $200,000. We've got about two or 3,000 people. We ought to be able to do it if we concentrate our effort and, and, and force. We may have to go to other states and ask other people to help us because there's not enough people in Oklahoma right now that understand what we're trying to do. But we're going to make this run, and we're going to capture this office. And when Johnny Reb gets elected to this office, we are going to push through our legislature because we will have organized in every county or parish in the state. And we're going to push through our legislature a, a demand that Congress pass or submit to the states a constitutional amendment acknowledging the right of nullification and success, uh, secession. Now, a lot of people say, wait, Johnny Red, that would just be another piece of paper. What are you talking about? No, 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 no. We don't care if Congress ever passes it. We don't care about that. What we want to do is be able to go to our state first and all of our sister states in the South and tell them and convince the people that we need this constitutional amendment. Because without the right of nullification, there's no interposition. There's no way to protect ourselves against the EPA that's trying to steal our water rights. Uh, there's all. There's no way to protect ourselves against the uh, homeland security that's trying to take away your guns. There's no way to protect ourselves against the United Nations treaty that, that the Republicans and the Democrats both allowed to go through Congress. But with nullification, we can do that. And an integral part of nullification is the ultimate right of secession. You can't have one without the other. So, we, so it gives us an opportunity, Johnny Reps describes to his small cadre of friends, to convert our conservative friends over to our ideology. Very important. Because right now, the average person in Oklahoma doesn't understand what you understand. If they understood what you understand, we wouldn't have any problem. But it's our job to figure out a way to convert our people, to win the hearts and minds of our fellow Southerners. So with this effort, Johnny Reb puts together this group. And they put together, they fund the campaign. And they win the campaign because who really thinks that Johnny Reb's going to win? And who really wants the uh, lieutenant governor's office? They win. And then every state in the South 
He goes, they have a legal sound meeting in, in Georgia, and, and Lieutenant Governor Johnny Rail from Oklahoma shows up to give the keynote speech. He goes over to the news media to be interviewed. All of a sudden, it's hard to ignore this new movement that's going on. It's getting the, the eye of the public. People are starting to talk about it. Now we have a real movement. Now all of a sudden the League of the South has 100,000 members or supporters across the South. Now we have become a force like the NAACP. You fool with us, you're in trouble. Politicians listen to that language. And we also begin electing our own Johnny Rebs in every state. And then, of course, the federal government's going to say, we're not giving up our federal supremacy. We're not, this, this, is, this is a rich thing for the status quo. They're not going to roll over and die. But we tell the Republican Party, you either get this constitutional amendment enacted, or the very next presidential election, Johnny Rebb, or one of the many other people who have joined him by now, we're going to run for president on our own Southern Independent Party, uh, whatever we'll call it. And even though we may carry this out, we won't win the election, but it's going to be publicized throughout the world that this is a plebiscite for Southern freedom. And guess what, Republican Party? You'll never have the presidency again. Think about it. For 150 years, those people have held the South hostage. Now, thanks to Johnny Reb and his cohorts in Georgia and South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky, Maryland, all of a sudden, we are holding them hostage. Hallelujah! <laughs> so, yes, it can be done. Would it be easy? Of course not. But that, ladies and gentlemen, would be a strategic victory, not a tactical victory. This will be something that will be fundamentally, a fundamental change in the way government is done and the way our people understand their relationship to the federal government. So very important. So in closing, I say let the word go out. The federal empire is bankrupt. Federal supremacy is a perverted, and literally and figuratively now, a perverted view of the Constitution. Today, a new generation of Southerners are here. We will no longer accept the rule of the federal empire. We dare defend our rights. We shall be free. <laughs>